morning. Let's all stand as we sing to our Savior today. great to see all of you here this morning. Thank you for coming on this day to come and worship. Um, have a seat, everyone. Hey, last week I shared with you the video from our uh, kayak camp that we had. This was middle school and senior high camps, um, and we go together in the same campground, but we kind of do a lot of things separate, um, and it was a powerful weekend. We had 96 people ended up going, um, and uh, I tell you what, um, great things happened, and we had kids give their life to Christ that last night, and uh, some reaffirmed their time with Christ, and others came up and prayed with them, and it was really a kind of a Pentecostal moment, um, and this is why we do this every year, and our la you know, that last service is it just absolutely amazing, and then if you went to the, the, the river, at Shoal Creek here, when we did baptisms uh, was two weeks ago, we had uh, people ranging from 88 down to 7. And we had a huge number of youth get baptized. After camp, they said, I want to get baptized. And uh, we, we just had an amazing time down at the river, too. So I want you to know, that's what your church is all about. This is what we're doing. And so I have the video. I showed it last week, but a lot of people are gone on the 4th. Next week will be the kids' camp video. But here is our kayak camp video.
That last uh, section right there, we're all waving. That's when we put the camps together on Thursday night. And look how beautiful. We're up on a knob of a hill. We can look over uh, into the hills around us. But what a great time it was. Amy? Hello? It will be. It's on. Good morning. How's everybody today? Um, I'm here to talk about VBS one more time. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, VBS is July 17th through 19th. It is a free program for kids ages three to just finish fifth grade. So if you have not yet signed up your child, grandchild, neighbor, whoever, make sure you do that soon because I'm already putting them in groups and it will be a lot quicker for your check-in process if you already have them pre-registered because they'll already be assigned to a group and they can just go right to their group as soon as they check in. So um, anyway, make sure you do that. We have some paper forms out on the unmanned table. I didn't man it this weekend. Um, so it's out there. If you want a t-shirt, I still have a few t-shirts left. I am out of children's medium. So if you did not get one, then you're either going to have to get one of my three larges left. So I'm telling you this because when I'm out, I'm out. <laughs> and I have some smalls and some extra smalls. And then I need I, an extra small. I have adult smalls, but I don't have extra small. But you can suck it together and put it in there, I'm sure. Probably not. Anyway, I am running low because I pre-order them. So you guys have had chances, just telling you. They're in the Children's Center, so if you want a T-shirt, Come back there to me, and I will see if I have your size. Also, if you pre-registered your child in their third to fifth grade, they will receive one of these little 30-day devotion books. Um, it is the MOVE curriculum for that. They will have a chance for each day during uh, their 30 days to read more into the stories, and it's a really cool book. These were $12 each, so thank you guys who have been donating money towards VBS because I've used it to purchase these books because I thought they were pretty cool. And the reason I say third to fifth grade is because this will not pertain to kindergartners. Uh, they're not going to get as much out of it as a third to fifth grader. So if they pre-registered, I have them in the back, so make sure they see me so I can mark off their name and make sure they get one. And when I run out, I'll just order more. So uh, pre-register them so they get one. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Yep. Oh, there is a volunteer meeting tomorrow night. So if you signed up to be a crew leader or a station leader, 
please come so I can give you pizza. That's the main reason, so you can eat. And whatever else I'm going to give you to eat. And then uh, we'll talk about VBS, uh, what our plans are, so you won't come in and think, what is going on? Okay? So you'll be, you'll be all good to go. Six o'clock, thanks. And if you did Six not o'clock. sign up to help with VBS... Then you have to help him, because yes. I'm pretty full. You can see Lachey and see if she needs more help in the kitchen, but I think we're full. Yeah, on helpers. Amen. But I need you. We are going to be working on landscaping. We've got a landscape down by the sign. We've got a spread mulch like we usually do every year and some other things. So if you have a tractor with a bucket, if you have a shovel and a rake and a willing spirit, men, women, and youth, come out and help us if you would. So during VBS, those three nights, we'll be outside working, uh, making the church better and, and uh, using that um, to make our church more beautiful but also down by the sign we've got a big project to do so could use your help all right hey you saw that river on the on the kayak camp i am taking an all church trip to the same river if you've never been on it i will be your guide i know the river extremely well and i know the outfitters we got a deal on the on the price and everything sign up there's a black table in the foyer sign up whether you want a kayak a canoe or a family raft um, and r- kayaks are just thirty dollars. That's pretty good for eleven foot, nice, pretty nice kayak. So, and we're leaving here at six a.m. So Tuesday, this Tuesday, supposed to be ninety degrees, partly cloudy, um, and twenty percent chance of rain. So twenty percent—that's probably when it's going to dump on us, going through a drought. But uh, anyway, um, I think it'll be a beautiful day on the river. And I hope you'll come and be with us. Bring a little lunch in a small cooler, that sort of thing, anything to drink and that sort of thing. And $30 for the kayak, uh, 51 for a canoe. All right. And uh, you'll, you'll look around. Some of our youth are missing today. They didn't just disappear. They came to early service this day. Um, and they all took out after, after service was over. We had them all up here. We have 25 of them, and they're heading to Colorado for kind of a retreat, a few days of fun, um, and it's a thing that they, it's called Lead the Cause, but it's teaching school kids, high school, um, how to witness to your friends and how to pray for people. A lot of people are scared to death of doing that, and this is one of those things. That it's, it's, a, it's a point of growth. For these kids and so they were excited to be heading out and so yes some of their families came to early service too so if you're looking around go where's so-and-so that's probably where they were they were in early service uh, today and so we're excited about that all right I want to invite the ushers to come forward at this time to receive our offering. If you are visiting with us for the very first time, you're our guest here. Please just allow the offering plate to pass you by. Um, and we're just very excited that you're here with us for worship. Father, as we come into your house, we've come ready to give, to give our tithes and offerings so that the kingdom of God may be built, that people might be baptized, that camps might happen, that groups will certainly seek your face. Father, we give to you so that many might be blessed. Amen. I had been working for Cisco Foods for 36 years when on March 22nd, 2022, nine days or so before I was supposed to retire, I had an accident. I was delivering food at North uh, Main Babes, uh, North Street on Babes. Early in the morning, nobody was there. Coming down off the, out of the freezer, got on the platform, coming down the steps, and I missed a step. Ended up falling flat on my back. Turned out I hurt my back pretty bad. My left calf muscle was bruised and bleeding. And I found out a little later I had my, br- broken my left elbow in two places. So that was a t- t- different situation. But when I got to the doctor, they said, well, we're going to have a hard time figuring out what's wrong with you because I was in so much pain I couldn't lay down. They laid me on the x-ray table, and I screamed, and they had to get me back up. They tried an MRI on my back, couldn't do that. I screamed, so they got me back up. They finally did a standing x-ray just to make sure I wasn't, well, I didn't need to go to the hospital. So I was fortunate I didn't have to do that. But they said, because you got so many injuries, we don't know what's going on, we're going to send you a specialist in Springfield. And I said, that's cool, get me there. Well, workman's comp said, not right away. 
So they sent me home with some pills, and they said, well, these pills will help you have some pain relief. And it turned out eh, it didn't help so much. So when I got home later that day, Loxy, my wife, helped me figure out one of the easiest ways for me to get relief was sitting in our cushioned wooden glider with my left arm on a pillow on an end table so I could support my pillow, my, my arm, I mean, and my left leg was on a cushioned footstool. Also during those first few days, Loxie called our family and friends here and in South Dakota, especially the church family here. A lot of you were praying for me at that time, and I knew I needed that because I couldn't get any sleep at all. It was just horrible. I am forever grateful. If you have problems, if you have a situation that you don't know how to handle, call the church. Call your family. If you're a born-again believer, God is here for you. He will help you through the difficult times. Also during that first week, Loxie's sister Becky had been praying for me and heard a song that she decided would help me. And so she sent Loxie the name. I looked it up on YouTube. Loxie isn't a YouTuber, so I was able to figure it out even in pain. And the song that I was able to find was just, I'll be honest about it, it wasn't my kind of song. It's a little more modern song. I'm a southern gospel kind of guy. But I listened to that song, and Loxie would lay her hands on me, and we'd pray. So uh, I was in this rocker for 29 days sitting here in pain by the going back and forth to Springfield for doctors but I was able to loop this song and keep it playing and Loxie would pray over me while I would listen to this song until I fell asleep and the song is called In Jesus Name and it was performed by Katie Nichols the list song I listened to I speak the name of Jesus over you in your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name, cause it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. I pray for your healing, that circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I speak the name of all authorities, declaring blessings, every promise he is faithful to keep. I speak the name no grave could ever hold. He is greater, he is stronger, he's the God of possibles. I pray for your healing that circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. It. Oh, the power of the Spirit, it's now forever yours. Come believe it, come receive it. In the mighty name of Jesus, all things are possible. I pray for your healing that circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray for a breakthrough, it would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. I pray for revival, for restoration of faith. I pray that the dead will come alive in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, as we continue on in the service now with prayer, um, Eileen DeWilt, um, part of our church, usually um, comes to Saturday and a few other services. But anyway, she's in the hospital. Also, pray for our kids um, the, that left for Colorado, the youth um, uh, lead the cause, that indeed they might be blessed during this week. Um, and it's interesting they're leaving for this to learn kind of and, and have the ability to um, to uh, um, share the gospel with people. And my message today goes right along with that. Um, and so, um, anyway, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, as we come into your house today, we just want you in our lives. And I know some people may be struggling for different, with different things in their lives. God, you comfort them. Give them clarity of thought. Let the Holy Spirit be upon them. And God, as we gather in the worship service today, may your Holy Spirit come. Come and be around us, above us, and in us. May your Holy Spirit truly touch us so that we can leave here today saying, you know what, I've been in the presence of God. Amen. And maybe something might change our lives, change our hearts, or change our minds. But God, you be involved with this worship today. And may we go out into the world and be servants for you. That we could go out and witness to people, to share with people the story of how our faith grew. How worshiping God changed us. And let us be out there being in ministry and prayer and witnessing for you. Be with us as we continue this service, as we sing praises to you, O oh God. And then we hear a message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father, today, God, today we come to worship you with our voice, with our presence, with our love, Lord. May we worship you in your word spoken. May we worship you when we go out in this world and show your light to others. May we be a beacon. May we be your tool. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, most of you know that during my teenage years, I was opposed to church. Um, I was opposed to God. And I uh, thought people that were um, believers in Christ were kind of dumb. Why would they want to give their money? They're just getting ripped off. And so that's the kind of person I was. But when later in life, when I was about 17, I had a massive transformation um, and uh, I came to Christ, and all things were new. I saw things um, that I had not seen before. And so um, I wanted to share a little bit about that. But after I became a Christian, though, I began to want my friends to know about Christ. So I began to share about Jesus. And uh, some of it didn't go so well. Um, some of my friends kind of ostracized me. That's all right. Sometimes I wonder, were they even real friends? Think about it. Um, and I'll always tell you, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And so um, I began to share, though. But I wanted to share about this. There's me, uh, high school senior photo in, sat in the Saturday service. Brian Robbins said, well, Chris, you haven't changed hardly at all. I said, thanks. He said, you looked like a preacher back then. So I, get, I don't know what that, I don't know. But uh, anyway, here I am, and uh, on, in Rhonda's yearbook, we start dating the, the gr high school graduation commencement practice we met. And we went out on our first date and skipped school the next day. And, uh, but I found out later, she was stalking me. She was after me because she was part of the journalism class that was getting the yearbook together. And she, she saw my picture of me. She says, who's that? And one of her friends said, oh, that's Chris Sohn. He's a nice guy. And from then on, I was stalked. <laughs> Off to the side of her year, yearbook, she says, cutie pie. Oh, yeah, she's here somewhere, way back there in the back. And I wish, I didn't think about it till Saturday service while I was preaching, but I wish I, I had gotten a picture of her senior book, or, you know, her senior picture. She's right across the page. There's one page just right there is the her. And anyway, um, but she's, um, here's some people. We graduated, I don't know, 430-some maybe of, in Glendale's graduating class in Springfield, Missouri. And back then, when our senior photos were taken, we just went to a photographer, sometimes like Sears photo mat, and uh, they would take about three or four pictures of you, you know, and they tilt your head in the weirdest angles, um, and they took a picture of you. Nowadays, with senior photos, oh my lands, it's hundreds of pictures, it seems like, and they'll go to the train tracks, then they'll go to an old business that has spray paint on the walls then they'll go out to the creek and girls oh my lands girls change change outfits five times for their senior photos um, we just had a click 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 okay get out of here and we had to pick our senior photo from that and yes maybe I do look like a preacher someone on Saturday service and um, in early service said well he looks he, he, he said that he looks like your grandson that, that, you know, the tie. And I'm like, yep, I have strong genes, you know, and uh, kind of annoys his dad that I, that his grandson or his son looks more like me, though. But uh, I, uh, in high school, though, I had this major change. And, uh, you know, high school is a difficult time for everyone. And I, I applaud these kids going to lead the cause, to learn how to pray for someone, to be bold in their, their witnessing, and to share their faith with people. I, I, and, and it's supposed to be so they can win kids in their high school for Christ. 
And, you know, high school is a tough time for everyone. Low self-esteem and everything else. And uh, um, high school was tough for me, too. It was the worst seven years of my life. And, uh, but, uh, hey, you know, um, I was able to witness and to share um, with, with folks in the high school. Maybe I brought some along in their faith. In the book of Acts, which is a book about the early church, you know, the, um, Jesus was resurrected already, but the apostles were running around still. And so that's what I'd term the early church. Most people say up to around 300 A.D. was the early church. But there's a great section of Scripture, and it's in chapter 2 of Acts, and you can read about the rest of it at home if you'd like. Um, But this really describes what the earliest early church was like. In uh, verse 46, we'll start there. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Now, the temple, it was the big temple that Jesus had taught in, and it has the Solomon's Colonnade all around the temple, and this is where people would have Bible study, where they'd meet, where maybe Pharisees would be teaching from the law book. Um, This is where Jesus met with his disciples and others. And the early church Christians would meet there as well. Now, they didn't have a Bible to study yet, but they had the apostles there with them. Maybe several of them in the group probably followed Jesus, or at least heard Jesus preach somewhere, and later they became a believer. But imagine to be under Peter. Peter's praying there, and then he's teaching in Solomon's colonnade, and and believers are everywhere, and people are just kind of wanting to find out about this Jesus guy are gathered. Wouldn't it be cool? to go back into a time machine and see this group of people. This group of people that were a people of faith and they were literally becoming the church. God always intended believers to meet together. Always. No exceptions. And to hear Peter with enthusiasm in his eye and sometimes with tears in his eyes, I think sometimes with laughter in his voice, He would share about Jesus. And this is how the early disciples and the early Christians learned about Jesus. And it'd be cool to go in a time machine to that place and see Peter talking to these believers. Now, you wouldn't have understood a word he said because it had been Aramaic, but it would be cool just to be there to see it. So they were gathering up. They broke bread in their homes, um, having meals together. And fellowship was a very big part of church. That's why I always invite people to come on Wednesday nights when we start back with Paul's Kitchen and we have the big dinner here. Um, And all the food's prepared by volunteers and it's fantastic food. And we gather together and eat together. Once you've eaten with someone for a while, you kind of get to know them. They start feeling like family. When I have someone say, well, I just don't know hardly anyone in the church, that's when I go on the attack. (laughs) Because it's your fault. Are you in a Sunday school class? No. Okay. Do you come on Wednesday nights? No. Do you come to the dinner? No. Then no wonder you don't know anybody. Do you know very many people at Walmart? And you go to Walmart more than you do church. I'm brutal as a pastor, aren't I? They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And I love this last part. This is kind of a conclusion of this section of Scripture. And the Lord added to, <clears throat> added to their number daily those who were being saved. Daily. People being saved daily. What's happened to the church in North America? Maybe we're lazy. 
I've been reading some stories out of Africa and Indonesia and Malaysia and of other places. And they do have people coming to Christ daily. There's a reason for that. I think people are excited about their faith. In Africa, where there's persecution happening, they're excited about Christ. In Indonesia, where many times they are persecuted as well, they are excited for their faith in Christ, and they want everyone else to enjoy it too. In America, we've been taught over the years, don't say anything, don't bring it up, you might offend someone. Last week, I shared with you D.T. Niles, he was an evangelist many years ago, and he said evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar how to find food. Got it? One beggar telling another beggar where to find food. That's what it is. We believers, we people who have come to Christ, we are no better than others. Although we've experienced mercy and forgiveness and we've been to the banquet table, okay? But we shouldn't say, oh, we're, we're so much better than everyone else. We're just a beggar, but we found food. Imagine not being able to eat for a while. And then someone says, Psst, come here. We got room in the house. Come on in. We're having a dinner. And you're like, me? Yeah, you. Come on in. And we walk in. And here you can smell the homemade yeast rolls as you walk in. And you go in and they say, have a seat, you're welcome. And we're sitting down in this big banquet table with a lot of people. Maybe we don't even know who they are yet. And then they start handing the food out. Fried chicken. Roast beef. Mashed potatoes and gravy. You can kind of see where I lean, don't you? They have bean dip on the table, too. And then they have their rolls, and someone smacks you in the face with a roll, just like over at Lampert's. I've only eaten at Lampert's a couple of times, and I leave there so full, I feel like I'm going to throw up in the parking lot. You ever had that experience? It's like, whoa, I ate too much. But imagine eating at a banquet and you haven't eaten for days and how good that food must taste. And you leave there being full for the first time for a while. What are you going to do? Are you going to keep that secret from all your buddies? You run into someone, hey Frank, how are you doing? Oh, not so well. I, don't, I haven't felt good and um, I haven't had anything to eat for a few days. Well, that's, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, we'll see you. Or do we say, Frank, come here. There's a house down the street here that welcomed me in, and, and, and they said, hey, everyone's welcome at our table. Why don't you come with me? I'll come with you, and, and you're going to see this banquet table. It's one beggar telling another beggar where they found food. My friends, this is the way it is spiritually. We all know of people that do not attend a church, that don't know, the, know Christ, that it's not a part of their life. And we should be like that beggar saying, oh, you've got to come. We should have that same excitement and that same push like we're saving a person from starving to death. Because, my friends, everyone needs to sit at that banquet table. Everyone is welcome. It's important for them to know about Christ. Amen. Now I'm hungry. The home of throwed rolls. Mmm, they just keep coming at it with food, and I believe this is kind of how it is with God's, God's grace. He just keeps coming at us. One beggar telling another beggar where we found food. And this it brought about the early church growth now how did it says here you know that it says they added to their numbers daily those being saved did they do a mass mailing is that how they got them in did they have a, 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 a flashy worship team did the pastor do it all i don't think so i think they were just excited and they had the holy spirit 
with them. And it, it showed on their faces. You know, the early church grew, even though um, here coming up in the story, you're going to have Jewish persecution where they come after Christians, especially the leaders. Later on, we will have Roman persecution of the Christian church and the faith. But do you know, all through that time of persecution, the church grew. Because one person told another person where that banquet was where they could find Jesus, where they could find salvation in their lives. And these people had this love and grace and forgiveness. And when it says they added to their number daily, those who were being saved, they wanted everyone to know God. And maybe we've lost that in North America. I'd say we have. Because when I read stories of other countries, even those that are being persecuted, they are excited about their faith. And they want everyone to know about it. We in North America, we've been told, don't say anything. Many of us are fearful of rejection. And over the years we've heard, you don't discuss religion. And some say, well, I don't want to offend my friends. What kind of a friend will they think you are if they find out later sometime that you knew where the banquet table was and you didn't invite them? And it's so easy, really. There's another story of how important it is to bring someone to Christ. And this is um, out of Acts chapter 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Philip was one of the apostles, and he said, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. You've heard of Gaza, right? The Gaza Strip. There was a highway. It'd lead from Jerusalem, and it'd make a sharp turn towards the Mediterranean, and the Gaza Strip was right along the Mediterranean Ocean. Pretty fertile land. And there was a road through there, and that's how you would head down, um, say, to Egypt or into Africa. And the Holy Spirit was, uh, was saying to him to do this. An angel told him. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in the charge of all the treasure. He was the treasurer for uh, this country in Ethiopia. And the queen was Candace, and in here it says Candake, um, but it, he was the queen. Um, I, I prefer the old one, Candace. This man, it says, had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was on his way home. Now, think about this. Why was an, an African man from Ethiopia, why did he go to Jerusalem to worship? Because he was Jewish. And people are like, what? Even today in Ethiopia, there's a large number of settlement population of Jewish people in Ethiopia. And people, that just boggles people's minds when I say that. But yes, in Ethiopia, and it goes way back, they believe anyway, in tradition to Solomon. Solomon had connections to that place, and people became Jewish in that area. Isn't that cool? In fact, they say they had the Ark of the Covenant that it was brought out of Jerusalem before it was conquered, brought down to Ethiopia so it could remain safe, and they still guard it today. And they say it's there. They guard it with guns, antique guns, but they guard it with guns. And no one's really saw, saw it except for their kind of keeper there. Um, but uh, that's, that's pretty cool, though. But again, a large contingent of Jewish people. So he was a royal official, um, had a lot of money, he was the treasurer, and so he would gone up to Jerusalem to worship. Well, that festival's over. They were head, he was heading home on this highway from Jerusalem to, into Gaza, and he's traveling in a sedan. It says a chariot, but remember, this isn't a little bitty chariot like you see on Ben-Hur. You know, you know. That's a racing chariot, it's, and, and war chariots were just a little bigger than that. This is one of the big chariots that w rich people would have. It had four doors kind of thing. 
And it would have a couch back there to sit on for whoever it is. And he would have had a driver. He would have probably had an armed guard. And maybe they had some guards on horseback. Remember, he was wealthy. So bandits would think, hey, easy pickings. But that's why he was probably going with an entourage back home. And so we see this big chariot, and he's sitting back, and he is reading Scripture. Now, we know he's wealthy. One, he has a sedan. Uh, Lincoln Continental of that day. And we know he was wealthy because he was reading a scroll. It says a book, the book of Isaiah. But it would have been a scroll. Um, during that time, all religious literature was written down by rabbis, and it had to match the original. That's how we know that Scripture is authentic to what was written so long ago, because if they write down all this in Hebrew, and if they make a mistake, a rabbi comes through and checks their uh, writing. I couldn't have done this. I would need a lot of whiteout, and they don't allow whiteout. But if anything, is there any mistake in that? They take it out and they burn it. Even today, all the religious manuscripts in a Hebrew synagogue that they keep in their little kind of closet with uh, um, all the scrolls, they are handwritten on sheepskin. Still. They have people that do all their lives, they work on copying scrolls in New York City and other places. But he was reading the scroll that he'd laid out, and it's from the book of Isaiah. So we know he had money just to afford one of these scrolls. Very expensive. <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So Philip kind of ran up to the chariot and started walking along. It wasn't going very fast, because those sedans back then didn't have springs. And so every bump you would have felt setting in that so they would have gone slow then philip heard the man reading from isaiah the prophet and asked the question in this chariot and it would have been kind of an open open chariot with a, a covering probably over it to keep the sunlight off he said do you understand what you were reading how can i he said unless someone explains it to me well, obviously Hebrew wasn't his first language, you might say. And now he's reading some, um, some prophecy in, in Scripture. Prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So in other words, join him on the couch that he had back in there. And this was the passage of Scripture that this eunuch was reading he was led like a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb before his shearer is silent so he did not open his mouth in his humiliation he was deprived of justice who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth well this man from ethiopia asked philip tell me please who's this prophet talking about himself or someone else. And then Philip began with that very verse of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. My friends, it is good news. In a world of bad news, in a world of bad things happening, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news, right? It is the good news for people that this life is not all. That we have a God that wants us back in a relationship with Him. And this all, my friends, is the good news. And so he began to witness to Him. He probably told a story. He told about meeting Jesus for the first time. He probably told about all the things that happened with Jesus. And who knows how far they went together traveling. But he was excited to share it. And he knew that God wanted him there. Um, sometimes God has shared with me some things he wanted me to do. And I'm like, well, that's crazy. That won't work. Or, hey, go by and see if so-and-so's home. And I, I would. 
And I was all the time driving thinking, this is nuts because they won't be home. They're at work. And so many times, though, when God has called me to do something, I follow. Reluctantly, yes. But you know, if God asks you to talk to a friend about Jesus, would you do that? If the Holy Spirit leaned you towards that, would you go? Well, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's some water. This guy was so excited. The Holy Spirit was already in his life. He was so excited. And he said, hey, look, here's some water. We don't know if it's a pond or a creek or a river. I love going down to the river um, and, and baptizing folks. A couple weeks ago, I told you about that. We had, and I don't know if I said it in this service or not, but we had ages from 88 to 7 with a huge group of youth in the middle. And all, they all got baptized. What a great time that was at the creek. But look here. Here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to the chariot to stop. In other words, again, he wasn't driving. He had a driver and probably a guard and that sort of thing. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. At the very end of this section. And it says... The eunuch went on his way rejoicing. In verse 39, he, he, he was rejoicing. He was excited. He was changed. He was different. Praise God. Amen? This is what happens. And you know, so many times we don't want to share, but I know uh, the, the, a few times that I shared when I was an early Christian, when I was, you know, the yearbook photo... When, uh, when I talked to people, I didn't know the Bible very well. I was a new Christian myself. But I did know what forgiveness felt like. I did know that the Holy Spirit was in my life. And so I began to share. And I remember one time I was witnessing someone and all of it. And, and you know, I'm not, I'm not terribly smart. You all knew that, right? And, and I was sharing a little bit about faith. And all of a sudden... I started saying things I never thought I'd say. All of a sudden, it was a lot brighter than what I could come up with. And I looked back on it thinking, wow. And then I was like, wait a minute, because the scriptures say that if we ever enter into persecution, and I imagine it's also in, in witnessing, because that was my, my evidence of all of it, is that God, do not worry about what you will say, because God will take care of it, will give you the words. And this is what I felt happening early on in my witnessing. And from then on, I've witnessed to thousands of people about it. And I hope, I hope you can say in your life that you've witnessed to many people. Here's some things, bullet points you might say. Um, think about a person right now. You know of someone that does not attend worship does not believe in God, perhaps, or they went to church as a kid or whatever, and they're not going now. You know who they are. They're coworkers, friends, people you're around with, um, neighbors, family. The hardest people to witness to are family, by the way. But you know who they are. So I want you to pick out someone. Think of someone right now. All right? You got it? If you say, I don't, I don't know anyone that's not a Christian, then you need to get out more. Number two, begin to pray for that person. Pray that the Lord might, might kind of bring an opening with that person. The Holy Spirit began to knock on their heart. And, and you know, I've even prayed this. Lord, make them miserable. That doesn't sound like a pastor's prayer, does it? Make them miserable. Lord, I've even prayed, let them, let them hit rock-solid bottom. I've prayed that for people. <laughs> yeah, I'm a real caring kind of guy, aren't I? But when they finally hit rock bottom, then they finally figure out in life 
that they need God in their life. If they're miserable, that God, then they're more accepting that God might come in and straighten everything out and get things going for them. And then, I, I, that's why I prayed it. So anyway, I pray for people. Now, you don't have to pray for everyone to hit rock bottom or to be miserable. But you can pray for them. Number three, begin to pray for yourself that you will be bold enough to go through a door that God opens. I mean, when we pray for that person, we pray for ourselves that a door might be opened, that we might have a chance to witness. There might be a great opening, like, you know, when they're going through a tough time or something, or, you know, I mean, it's simple as saying, hey, why don't you come church with me? But that you'll be bold enough to go through that. And if you, if you offer God a prayer that put me where I need to be, God, and God puts you where you need to be, you had better say yes. You better go through that door. You better start that conversation. So here it is. You pray to be bold enough and to have an opening to share. And that fourth one is, yes, then take that step. Share, invite, witness, and pray with them perhaps. So here are the four things that we're gonna, if we're going to share our faith with a friend, here are four things that we would do. I want, to, I want to tell a story, and that would be the end of the message today. But it's a story of Jake Sherrill. <clears throat> Here's Jake. He has owned a barber shop in Nashville, Tennessee, by the projects, since 1957. Imagine that. Um, you can see that he was a mason. I'm very proud to be a mason and very proud to be a believer in Jesus Christ. He is a Methodist. He was one at one time an AME, American Methodist Episcopal Church, um, and then also then United Methodist. This is from the uh, Good News, and it was about a year ago that this, uh, this article came out. He has on his, on his barbershop by the front door hanging up there is a picture of his church. He's very proud of that. And he, he, he said, if you come in here and want me to cut your hair, we're going to bring up in a conversation some, somewhere down the line how you feel about joining this church. It just got to be a part of my life. I felt so strong that I could draw people to Christ. His daughter said of him, said, he, he's led, protected, and guided so many of our black men. This is how we're supposed to be. To help lead, to mentor, to protect one another, especially the young. One of the young men said this about him. He raised me in this barber shop ever since I was nine or ten years old. I've been coming around through here. I grew up in the projects right across the street. This man always looked out for me. He kept me on the right path. He got on to me when I was doing wrong. That happens too. And when I was doing right, he was proud of me. I messed up one time and he got on me about it and said that's not the life to live. He straightened me out, and I've been straight ever since. And then uh, he begins to share about his life and how he came to Christ. He said that he went to a church and they had a mourner's bench. Have, how many have ever been in a church with a mourner's bench? Anyone? No one on Saturday night. We had two in early service and no one here. I haven't ever seen a mourner's bench either. But that was the traditional in some churches a long time ago. And it was on, up near the front. And uh, people who really need to pray, who had gone through a horrible time, and they, they were supposed to pray. Also, a lot of times would people go up there when they were wrestling with God and they were so close to giving their life to Christ. They'd come up on the mourner's bench, and many of them on the mourner's bench would be crying. 
but that's okay. You know, church is a safe place to cry. And so he said he'd set up on the mourner's bench a couple of times. He said, something got a hold of me that night, and it ain't been the same since. I was 13, and from that day on, God had his hands on me. And then he talked about joining the church where he's still a member today. One friend said this about him. He's an ambassador for Christ. Wouldn't that be cool for some friend to call us an ambassador for Christ? And there ain't no shame in it. It's just what he does. If you come around Jake, he's going to talk about Jesus. And of course, you know, perfect for a barber. You got a person sitting there and you've already started a haircut. If they don't like it, they can leave with a hair, hair that just kind of messed up. Wow. If you come around Jake, he's going to talk about Jesus. Does, do people say that about us? And if you got anything going on in your life, he's going to tell you the answer is Jesus. Well, my friends... Maybe you can be the person to introduce someone to Christ. I know all you have to do is sometimes just say, hey, you go to church anywhere? No, I want you to come with me. I'll pick you up. Or I'll take you out to eat afterward or whatever. But we bring them. And most of us here, or most of you all I should say, you came because someone invited you here. Oh, you might have bumped into the church in some way. Um, I know one person was actually told by the Lord to pull into the parking lot. Kind of cool stuff like that. But most of us here came because someone cared enough to invite us or to talk about faith. And imagine if someone might come and they come for a few weeks in church and they start sensing that God is working in their life. Pretty soon they want to get into a study like a, a Sunday school class that we have um, or Wednesday nights when it's happening and, and they start growing in small groups. Pretty soon they want to get baptized down to Creek as they give their life to Christ. And then, yes, they'll want to join the church. This is what happens. One beggar telling another beggar where to find food. Amen. Uh, is Scott and Becky Stu being with us today? I didn't see him come in. Okay, they must not have made it today. Well, guys, would you please rise for the benediction? Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and share with one another all that I have given you. Amen. Amen.